Okay. Thank you all for joining us for the feedback for strategies to enhance learning session. And thank you all to those of you who are reviewing the recording. Thanks for joining us as well. To kind of get the community building started, if you could please share a, an emoji in the chat to let us know how you're doing today. Uh, that's a, a simple technique that you can use to start building those connections between students and um, in the, the learning community. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, Farah, um, for sharing that, great. Looks like we have a good foundation for collaboration today. And my name is Yvonne Johnson. I work in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. And I've completed the um, AQ Credentialed Educator Program that uh, NIU started working with a couple of years ago. I teach for, I, I help faculty with their pedagogy and andragogy and techniques for integrating technology with learning. And I also teach doctoral cohorts for the College of Health and Human Sciences. And to continue that community building, if you could please uh, post your name and your unit, what you teach at NIU and why you joined the session today. And we have a small group. So if you want to share in the um, you know, by engaging your microphone, that's fine. Um, or you can also share in the chat. So does anybody want to um, share their role at NIU and why they joined the session today? I can go ahead and share. Hey, thank you. No problem. Uh, my name is Farah Ishak. I'm an assistant professor of sport management here at NIU in the Department of Kinesiology and Physical Education. Um, primarily teach sport management uh, classes. And in terms of why I joined today, um, honestly, I think I can improve a little bit on grading um, and the type of feedback that I'm giving and when I give that feedback. Um, so hopefully this uh, session helps address some of those things. Okay, hey, terrific. Thank you, Farrar. And yes, we will be talking about feedback and techniques for integrating that feedback and when to share that and, and how that we can encourage students to use that to improve their, their learning. Okay, great, thank you. And I see we have others from uh, different departments, so please feel free to, to share your backgrounds and insights today as we go through the session. And we've done a, a tech of the check to see if people can hear me. And okay, Anna, uh, excuse me, Vilma Aponte is, uh, you teach English to undergraduate students. Terrific, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Vilma, appreciate that. And when we have a, a mixture of disciplines and backgrounds and experiences in the learning community, it builds a solid foundation for constructing knowledge and, and sharing different perspectives. And, and those are important in our workshops and seminars for our professional development, as well as important for our students and, and supporting their learning. And does anyone wanna share a, a type of feedback that they provide to students in courses that they teach? Just, just one example of some type of feedback that, that you share with students. Okay, we'll talk about different types of feedback today. We will talk about strategies for providing effective feedback and the different types of feedback, uh, sources of feedback could be from the instructor or from peers or student reflection. We'll also talk about how to help students use the feedback that is shared with them and different technologies that you might consider for sharing feedback. And it's important to, to have 
some sort of a plan for sharing your feedback with students and thinking carefully about how that feedback connects with the course, supports the students learning. And we'll talk about some techniques that you can, can use for that. In your feedback plan, think about feedback that you can provide before the assignment, before the students actually complete the assignment, and then after the assignments. And before the assignment, the instructions are very important for um, making sure that the students understand what's expected from the um, from them in, in the assignment, when the instructions are clear, you will see that as your instructions get more clear, then you'll have less questions from students about the assignments and they'll be able to focus more on actually learning and applying the material in the assignment rather than getting hung up on not being clear on the instructions for the assignment. And in the instructions, if there are requirements such as the type of format, maybe you have a um, APA or MLA or some sort of specific format that they're supposed to follow, that would be addressed in the assignment instructions. And if there's a certain length that they need, types of um, expectations for the style, sometimes assignments are more informal Sometimes they are very formal and they would be in the format that might be presented to a professional conference, as an example. So, so the actual style may be very different depending upon your purpose for the assignment. You can tell students about the acceptable structure for the references. Do they need to have a certain APA, MLA, et cetera, format for their references? In the text, do they need to have a bibliography, things like that, due dates, technology requirements or options, things like that. And then a description of, of how you're going to measure their standards for um, success. And Faraz talking about using Blackboard rubrics, and we will look at those a little bit as we go through the session today. And yes, rubrics are an excellent way to provide students information before they complete the assignment, they could pull up the rubric. And you'll see that we have rubrics also as reference, um, as helping with that being equitable in terms of, of having those standards set out there for all the students before they complete the assignment. And then you can use the rubrics and comments to provide them suggestions for improvement as well. And thank you for sharing that for I appreciate that. It's also important that the feedback is meaningful to the students because when they put a lot of effort into, into creating those assignments and when, when we provide them feedback, uh, it's meaningful when we can show that the feedback is aligned with the learning objectives for the course, the learning objectives for that particular assignment and that the students can clearly see how that feedback connects with those learning objectives and supports their knowledge. When they can see those alignments, then they're more likely to value the feedback and continue to integrate it to support their ongoing learning. And in terms of equitability for grading and um, standards for the assignments, the rubrics do help a lot. And you can also use anonymous grading for uh, as a Blackboard tool when you're grading. And this is not a Blackboard workshop, but we will talk about some of the different tools that you can use in Blackboard. And then you could pursue taking one of those Blackboard workshops if you're interested in some of those tools in more detail. But I've found over the years that Blackboard rubrics have saved me a lot of time. I've continued to refine them every year when I teach the same course and students really appreciate them because they feel like they know what's expected. And, and then when they have a question about the assignment, they can go back to the rubric and they can see 
what they may uh, need to improve for the next time. And in your feedback plan, consider using formative feedback, uh, formative assessments, formative feedback. And those are very, very important in terms of supporting the students learning. And formative feedback uh, would be those shorter, lower stakes assignments that you would provide students while they're learning the content and the key information in your course. You provide them feedback on how they've applied the, the principles in their assignments, um, how they've written explanations or shared explanations in class, and then you give them suggestions about how maybe they could refine their understanding or their application of those principles and uh, learning objectives. And one of the things that I do in my classes is I'll have a large assignment due at the end of the course. And then, and then throughout the course, I, will, I have broken up the different weeks into smaller segments of that larger assignment. And that provides the opportunity for students to learn the information, those focus on the learning objectives in, in chunks, get feedback from me on how they've um, done on applying and um, fulfilling those learning objectives piece by piece as they're going along in the course, they're forming um, and constructing knowledge. And then at the end of the course, they would take that feedback from those smaller assignments and integrate it into that large course project. And then the end result is that they have a higher quality final project because they've had formative feedback while they were learning. And that feedback is really important because if a student misunderstands something that is foundational to their success in the course or success on a project, and they don't get that clarified while they're learning, then they may continue to have that misunderstanding and apply it incorrectly in that final, final assignment. And it's, it's important to provide feedback in a timely way, and this can be a challenge for uh, instructors and uh, faculty because we know that feedback, giving meaningful feedback takes time. And we'll talk about some different techniques that you can use to, to save some time today. And when you think about feedback and the timeliness of it, think about maybe when you were a student and we're living in a time when there's quite a bit of almost instantaneous communication, a lot of information coming at us from a variety of different ways. And a week or two weeks receiving um, from when they submit an assignment to when they're going to get feedback can seem like a really, really long time when they're accustomed to these more um, instant and uh, spontaneous types of communication. So um, the, the closer in time that you can provide that feedback, the better because the students will be able to take that feedback and adjust their learning and their assignment work rather than um, providing feedback um, a number of weeks after they've submitted the assignment. And then they've just kind of mentally moved on um, beyond that particular assignment in the course. And um, one, one tip that is important to set the expectations for students is that they can, if, if you use your Blackboard course and you post the feedback plan, your standards for when you're going to communicate with them, provide them uh, their grades and things like that, post that in your Blackboard course, and then you can discuss it on the first day of class. You can have it in your Blackboard course so the information is persistent there. 
And then students know what to expect. They're not constantly going online and saying, oh, you know, I wonder when I'm going to get a grade on XYZ project. You have explained it in the Blackboard course, and you give them some information about how to find that feedback. And you can, in, in this particular example, the feedback, this professor said that the feedback would be posted within three days of the assignment due date. You as a faculty would need to decide what time um, frame is reasonable for your workload, for supporting the student's learning, and then come up with that time and post it in your course. And then, and associate it with the rubric and then the students know those expectations before the assignment and they know after the assignment when they can expect to receive that feedback from you. And, you know, if they can receive it um, in, a, in a week, that's wonderful because then they're, they, you know, it's kind of like the assignment wraps up that, wraps up that week, you provide them feedback, they continue to build upon that. If that's not um, something that's manageable for you, then think about what would be manageable for you. And, and just keep in mind the, uh, the student version of, of when, you know, they think, okay, get this done as soon as possible. It's supposed to be done yesterday. And a professor version is, you know, I'll get to your paper as soon as I can. And you have in this mind, you know, in your mind, this stack of, of assignments that you need to grade. And, and so you think, oh my goodness, when am I going to be able to get this done? But integrating your, um, the set timeframes with your workload will help you to um, balance that out and, and helps cut back on the stress of students because they know what to expect. And we'll talk about some different types of feedback, um, sources of feedback, where the students can get feedback. Um, they clearly get feedback from the faculty member. And it's important that the feedback is on a regular basis. And anytime that you can create a rhythm in your course, that really helps to, to keep the students engaged. It settles them down. It gets them in a, in a pattern of submitting work and then you submit them feedback and then they submit more work and they revise it based on your feedback and and then the course they kind of settle down and they can really focus on on the learning and particularly when you are engaging online and you might have less opportunities for synchronous sessions depending upon how your course is set up and, and that even raises the importance of feedback and consistency more because it helps students to connect with the course and, and they feel like, okay, you know, I'm in this course with this group, I'm getting this feedback, everything's going along as expected. But if they're not getting feedback for a number of weeks, then that's a situation where they can kind of lose, lose connection with the course and, and that's not a good situation. And when you are providing feedback, it's important that it's evidence-based and um, some of these, these concepts are adapted from the Quality Matters rubric that we talk about in our on online course design academy. But evidence-based is important. You can align that with the learning objectives and then you connect the feedback with part of the assignment that the student completed. And so there's evidence to say, okay, you know, this is the rubric. This is what you said in your assignment. Here's the evidence and um, here's my suggestions. And we'll look at some um, examples of that in a little bit. And when you're providing feedback, uh, it's, it's a good idea to think about balancing that feedback providing some positive comments and some suggestions for improvement and some encouraging um, encouragement for the students so that they continue to want to learn and believe that they have that agency to be successful in the course. 
And some people talk about that in terms of uh, kind of sandwiching the feedback, say something positive, say, oh, you know, good job on the assignment. You did X, Y, Z well. Um, you know, this learning objective was met because here's the evidence in your assignment. And then you can say, in terms of this aspect of your assignment, um, my recommendations are that you need to include, you know, more references to uh, research-based articles or or examples of the situation that you required or something like that. So you have something positive, and you have some recommendations that are aligned with the learning objectives. You have evidence. And then you say, um, you know, that's great. Continue to integrate these recommendations as you revise the assignment. And um, you're providing positive and then some recommendations and then some encouragement to kind of kind of wrap up that that sandwich. And make sure that the information that you provide is actionable and so, you know, good job would not be enough. That doesn't tell them anything. Um, so you need to be more specific in terms of, um, you know, my recommendation is that you, you know, take a look at um, certain, certain area of the, the course material and integrate that in more detail with your explanation of whatever you're asking them to do. And I, I frequently refer to my, my course texts and readings and different discussions that we had with students when I'm providing them feedback. And then the next time they um, provide a revision for that assignment, then they, they know, okay, you know, the requirement for this is that I need to make sure that I have evidence, examples of, of this particular research design. I teach research proposal development courses. And we talk about different research methods. And so they need to be able to say, this is a way that I could use the narrative qualitative method for um, answering my research questions or, or maybe the case study or something like that. Um, so it needs to be something that they can take action upon and measure it. So when you provide this feedback, that's actionable and it's aligned with the, with the objectives of the course and it's positive and has recommendations. And then you can measure it because you gave them something that was actionable. And then you can say, okay, yes, you know, I recommended that they include two different qualitative research methods when they were explaining possible approaches to answer their research questions. And, and they had only included one, and now I can measure, yes, they've included two or, or three or whatever the expectation is. And then you can see the student's progress and, and they can also see it, and then they'll, they'll continue to progress in the course. Some of the ideas for ways that the, the faculty member or instructor can provide feedback is there can be draft or formative assignments. And that's what I, um, when I redesigned my research proposal and qualitative research course a number of years ago, I broke up those big end projects of the course into smaller draft formative assignments. And so then I scaffold that feedback and then the students are learning and their, their knowledge is growing throughout the class. And you can also provide feedback to the whole class. If you see some sort of a, a trend, some sort of a theme that maybe it looks like a number of the students are struggling with some kind of concepts then and that would be an opportunity for you to address the whole class and say, okay, you know, you submitted this first version of your research questions for your research proposal. And I've noticed that 
the questions um, seem to have a quantitative um, slant as opposed to a qualitative research um, focus. And so talk about, okay, now this is what you all need to do to, to apply these qualitative research methods to when you're developing your research questions. And sometimes it's important to have individual conferences with the students. We have many tools that we can do that virtually, virtually now, or um, sometimes face-to-face uh, -face might be an option depending upon what's appropriate for the, the way that you're conducting your course. Screencasting is an option. You might, if the student submitted some work and you think, you know what, I need to kind of explain to them with this work in front of me on the screen in front of them, what I expect them to do. And that would be a way for you to provide them um, a voice and a visual type of feedback. And that can be very useful in supporting students learning and providing different types of, of feedback also reaches students who have different preferences and, and keeps them engaged. And in terms of the feedback that you all share with your students, what is an example of, of some way that you've included maybe a formative assignment to provide feedback or a type of feedback that you've provided to the students? Okay, one, one way to provide that feedback is to, to use those rubrics as, as Farah had mentioned. Um, that is a very effective way to provide feedback. And I'll share some different approaches as we continue through the session today. And another source of feedback can be feedback from other students. And there are different approaches that you can use for this. And I, I started doing that a number of years ago and refined that process. Um, when, I first, when I first did uh, feedback from students a, a long time ago, I had um, a student in the course who was a, a teaching assistant. And, and um, instead of providing some, some of that encouraging feedback, that person um, took it really to the level of, of almost grading, grading the assignment. And so we had a discussion about, you know, what, what type of feedback is, is appropriate from other students. It's important for them to, to be able to experience this role shift. They're used to getting feedback from, from the instructor or the faculty member, not necessarily providing feedback to other students. And some of the ways that you can help this to be effective is that you can set some guidelines or have some students work together to set expectations and guidelines for the feedback. They can use the rubric or a checklist. And depending upon the type of assignment it is, for, for my really, really involved research projects, I have a checklist that has different components that the students meet because if I did a rubric, it would be too long and it really wouldn't be effective. So, so think about are there certain key aspects that that you want the students to provide feedback to each other on, or you could have the students decide when when they're working on some kind of a plan or some kind of a project, they might be really wrestling with a certain concept in this particular project. And so they may say, you know what, I'm really working on, on the design of the research, research method now. So that's what I want feedback on. I don't want feedback on the bibliography or the introduction. I really want feedback on this, this method section. And then that helps 
the students to get the feedback that they need that's valuable. It's formative because they're getting this feedback when they're learning and, and it's useful to them. They feel like, yes, you know, the, the course is designed, designed to really help me and, um, you know, I'm, I'm getting what I need as I'm learning. So, so those are some different options for, for considering how you can have students provide feedback to other students. You want to make it a, a positive, constructive type of experience. They could um, provide general feedback or answer specific questions about the assignment. Um, some of the feedback that students have given in terms of getting this feedback from other students is that the students comment that they feel more connected with the others in the course. They feel more connected with the learning community. They get more comfortable asking for suggestions from their peers. And I started to use small groups in my doctoral level courses. Um, and I have them, the small groups created in Blackboard and the students are working with their small group and they develop those relationships and, and they begin to ask questions and they begin to say, oh, I hadn't seen this particular research question from that perspective. I hadn't considered that maybe I could even use a phenomenological approach to, to research to answer this question. And it really helps them to feel more comfortable in the course and, and be open to, to suggestions. And always make sure that the, I always make sure that the discussions and everything in the course is aligned with the course learning objectives. And then you know that you're going to overall touch on and help students reach all those learning objectives and they can see the alignment and it makes sense to them. Some different ideas are you might have peer reviews or critiques of papers. Um, you could have them use the rubric. Um, one of the things I do is I encourage students to use the rubric themselves when they're creating the assignment so that they, I mean, they really should be able to grade their own work if they follow the rubric. And plan out a time for the student to student interaction and make it a part of the course design and part of that feedback design, because then it's um, it, it seems like it's aligned with the course. It seems to be an important part of the course. And when you have groups, you might have them work on contracts for civility. You know, what are the standards for behavior here? You have checkpoints and I set those up at regular. I build them into the, to the course plan and I have them provide feedback um, you know, every other week. And so then they know, okay, we're going to be providing feedback to other students every other week. And there are tools in Blackboard. You might use discussions or you could use, uh, some professors use a wiki or um, they can exchange files or they can use Blackboard Collaborate. There's a lot of tools that they could use and think about how you can use those tools effectively in your courses. And when you use a couple of different tools, it, it helps keep the students engaged. I, I wouldn't say use a whole bunch of different tools, but, but use several different ones to, to kind of keep the interest in the class and, and touch on the different needs of the um, learners. And when there's a specific place where and time where this feedback from student to student is, is integrated with the course, then it has value. They can use the Blackboard tools and they can ask questions. Maybe they don't understand the necessarily the research topic or whatever topic you're teaching necessarily from the other student's point of view. I have students who, who research very different complex health issues. And so they, they have an understanding of, of healthcare systems and issues and things, but 
they might not know specifically about this particular health issue, but they, they have knowledge and they can ask questions that can help the other person progress. And they can say, you know, honestly, I, I read that and I wasn't sure why you chose that ethnographic approach to researching um, as a method for answering your research questions. Could you maybe explain that a little more? And, and that's something, a similar question could come from other people reading their, their research and their work products. So it's good to get that type of feedback as well. And then self-reflection is a very important aspect of learning. It helps the students to begin to discover within themselves that they have the answers, begin to continue to develop those critical learning and critical thinking, critical analysis, critical thinking skills. And they begin to, to develop proficiency at this reflection, and then they can become more self-directed learners. And I integrate a lot of self-reflection opportunities in my courses. And for instance, at the end of a, an assignment, I will have a couple of different prompts to ask students to reflect on what they learned from that assignment. Their short prompts, they're open-ended. Um, they might include something like, while you were developing the purpose statement and your research questions for this assignment, what challenges did you have and how did you overcome those? And then the students have to think about, okay, you know, I was struggling with this because I just completed a statistics class and now I'm applying qualitative research approaches. And so I have to really kind of flip that um, mindset and think about qualitative approaches. And, and then they think about, okay, so yes, they, they flipped that mindset, they looked in, in the course content and they said, okay, this is what I need to do. Um, you know, I need to follow these examples. I need to follow and meet these principles to be able to effectively apply the qualitative research methods and ask them what insights they gained and, and what they're going to do next. And then they'll say, okay, I, I learned that I need to follow these, these research standards and these principles to make sure that I have a robust qualitative study. And the next time I'm going to use this reference that is a, include standards for evaluating qualitative research to make sure that yes, I have met those rigorous standards in my research proposal development. And I include those reflection assignments frequently in my courses and it's, it's interesting to, to consider what the students are saying and, and to watch their, their learning development and their self-directed um, learning skills, skills develop. It really is great to see them continue to construct that knowledge and, and be more effective researchers. And to try to help students use that feedback, uh, Farah had mentioned the rubrics. So we're going to look at a rubric there in a little bit. But we want to make sure that when we provide comments to students, that, that they use these comments, apply them, and to improve their work. And for this particular example, the um, instructor is focusing on the purpose statement, and they say provide, provide more detail. And they're also looking at the, the goal statement. You can see that they've used those Blackboard tools to highlight and to provide, to buy, provide comments. Now, the, when you look at some of these examples, provide more detail. So to, to enhance that, that feedback, you might say provide more detail aligned with Cresswell and Poth's um, description of the, the purpose statement. And then 
um, when the student looks at the Cresswell and Poth text, then the student would say, oh, you know, there's five components of the purpose statement and I only included two. So I need to make sure that I address those. And so you can see that adding that recommendation to connect their details with this course text is going to help them to have an actionable item that they can, and it's measurable, an item that they can revise. And then you can go in and look at it the next time they submit it and say, oh, okay, yes, they've provided the detail, they connected with Cresswell and Poth. And now we have a strong purpose statement. And in the second um, example there with the green, there it's related to the goals and the instructor is asking, what do you think the goals were? And that's ask, it's a more open-ended question, trying to ask the student to expand their thinking and say, okay, well, what do I think the goals were? You know, I, I said that they um, should not be assumed as givens and they might not relate to the goals of the program, but but the person, the student wasn't specific and didn't, didn't say what the goals were. And so um, the instructor is saying, okay, expand your mind, think about that and, and share that. And that is something that you would be doing when you're writing up a research proposal and a, uh, an analysis of a research project. So those are some examples of how you might provide some, some evidence you're referring to the specific parts of the assignment, you're providing um, suggestions, measurable feedback, and, and we're considering and looking at this, what's missing. And there are technologies that you can use for providing feedback. We have so many of those available to us today. And what I recommend is that you Consider tools that are going to be useful to you and the students and um, consider carefully which technologies you use. And because you don't want to have to spend extensive time trying to figure out a technology, if there's something that is already available and built into the course, then that is going to be useful. And it's going to be um, more, more time effective for you and for the students in this process. And Farrar had mentioned that, that he uses the uh, Blackboard rubrics and the Blackboard rubrics, I started using those a number of years ago. And, and it was an interesting um, paradigm shift for me because when, when I was in um, undergrad or really throughout, even throughout um, many years past undergrad, Rubrics weren't used at, at that time when I was in school and rubrics are very common now. And, and so um, students are accustomed to these rubrics and you can build them in Blackboard. You can build in feedback. You can provide feedback on these different aspects of the rubric. And I had a discussion with my, my daughter who graduated from college uh, about five years ago we had a discussion about rubrics and she was a um, high achieving student. And, you know, we're having a discussion about rubrics and she said, mom, she said, rubrics are very valuable to me. She said, I use these um, so that I know what is expected for this particular project. She said they're, you know, they help all students, whether your um, student is in just learning about a particular subject and, in those more introductory level type of skills, or if they're advanced, rubrics help all the students and you as a professor, they can greatly help your grading to be equitable and you can use um, anonymous grading. So you're not having some preconceived notions um, impacting your grading. And you'll, you'll see that they can really facilitate um, the grading process and you can for each one of these individual aspects of the rubric you can actually provide feedback on that and then um, that could be more specific if, if you thought it was important to do that 
And something that I've been developing over the years is feedback banks for assignments. And so I'll set up a, a Word document or some people use different technologies, but set up a document and keep comments in that document for all these different assignments that you have. And those build over the years and you can have, and, and so that can make your grading faster. And you're still providing that key feedback that students need to continue to progress, but you're helping yourself to be, um, to make that workload more, more manageable. So that's something that you might, you might consider as creating some sort of a, a feedback bank for yourself. And you can look at this and you can see which, which different aspects of, of this feedback are um, evidence-based or that they're balanced or, um, or measurable. And when you look at this, you can see that the, um, you're providing a recommendation there. I noticed that you're unable to answer the questions posed to you in the discussion. Please be better prepared for the, or ask for assistance. So that's the part about the constructive recommendations. And then you balance that with the, some of the positive comments and some recommendations. Um, you have the recommendations for, for the future in there. So those are some um, simple options that you could use to make sure that your feedback is effective. And some, some professors use, well, you, you can show the students where to find their feedback. You can create some screen captures. And we have lots of Blackboard tutorials on our Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning site. You can refer students to those and show them where they could um, find their feedback in the course. And when you provide these examples in your Blackboard course, then the students can be self-directed. They can go in there and find that information and then um, they can find it whatever time they need it and they don't have to wait for um, a response from you. So it it's, makes it a more efficient process for them and supports their learning in a timely way. And um, depending upon the course you teach, you might deliver tests and when you create tests in Blackboard, and we have some seminars on this um, from our center, and you can provide the feedback associated with the questions. And when you provide that, then when, this, when the test is graded, they'll get the, the feedback. And so you can decide what kind of feedback. You might, you might say, this is incorrect because of whatever, or, or look at XYZ resource or, or some, you get to decide what kind of feedback to provide, but it's built into the test. So um, it's a little bit of effort extra in the beginning when you're building the test, but it pays off as you have that built in into the test and then you can continue to refine it and use it again and again. And some of the options for different types of feedback that you might provide um, you might have students do blogs or wikis and wiki, they can share information um, and revise together and blogs, they can respond and, and provide feedback. And sometimes VoiceThread or uh, Flipgrid are used to provide some audio and video. I use Flipgrid for introductions in my courses. I'm thinking about using it for feedback um, to let students provide feedback to each other on some of their assignments too. Or we also have uh, Kaltura Capture where they might provide some short feedback. And there's some annotation or editing tools that you could use in discussion boards. A lot, of, a lot of courses have discussion boards and there's some annotation and editing tools that you might consider as well. And one of the tools that we implemented a few years ago at NIU, well, started using uh, at a much uh, 
more widespread level a few years ago was the Blackboard Portfolio Tool. And that's a way to have student, students collect their work and put it in a portfolio type of a format. And then you can provide feedback on their portfolio. So it's a different way. I mean, some, some professions use portfolios as a way for applicants of jobs to share their work products. And if that's the case with your particular profession, you might consider using a Blackboard portfolio and then providing feedback to that. You might have them use journals, um, self-scoring. That's something that I, um, as I mentioned earlier, they can use the rubrics or the checklists to, to score themselves. And they can also provide feedback um, to you to let you know what maybe could be some enhancements for your particular course. And there's a, a Teach Thought resource that has some information about effective feedback for learning. It should be educative in nature, timely, sensitive to the individual needs of students. Um, there's a wide variety of, we talked about whether it's a one-on-one -on -one conference that's appropriate or, or discussing with the whole class. Reference a uh, knowledge or skill that you're helping them develop in the class. And in those inline grading tools for Blackboard, you can, you can highlight and you can post specific feedback on different aspects of the, the assignment that they submitted. So those are the main aspects of, of the feedback that can help you. As, as I said, we there's different ways that the professor and the faculty can provide feedback. And it's important that it's consistent and ongoing, that it's has evidence, is actionable and measurable, um, that there's positive and constructive recommendations. And when you're integrating these techniques, I would suggest that you, you know, try try a tool that might work, you think might work for your course for feedback, get comfortable with that, and then try another tool. Um, or, or maybe you don't need additional tools, but, but don't try to change everything at once. Try to make incremental manageable changes when you are doing some revisions and redesign on your course. And the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning is, is available. You can contact us to get some appointments. We have lots of workshops to support your professional development. And we have lots of resources on our website that are available. You can look at tutorials or our quick guides to help you work through the processes of um, how you can provide feedback. And so we are getting to 